Welcome to this new episode of Ask Stago, the podcast dedicated to provide expert answers to your expert questions in hemostasis. I am Audrey Carlo, and I'm really happy to be here again with Cécile Orquet to co-host this show. Today, we will discuss a very specialized topic, platelet agrigrometry. We will try to understand what it is and in which indications it is useful to measure it. Yes, Audrey, and to cover the topic with us, we are lucky to welcome David Courtois. David, you are a product line manager at the Global Marketing here at Stago, and one of your product line is Platet Agricometry. So for you, there will be no problem explaining us further this technique of Platet Agricometry, I guess. Hello, Cécile. Hello, Audrey. Thank you for inviting me, and I promise I'll do my best to demystify platelet agregometry. Actually, David, you used the right word. I have the feeling that platelet agregometry is so complex that it is a kind of a myth. But let's start with the basics, as we are used at during here at this show. Can you tell us what are platelets? Well, platelets are small cytoplasmic fragments of a cell, the megakaryocyte. Platelets, also called thrombocytes, are any create discrete cells with a short lifespan of 7 to 10 days, but playing a major role in primary hemostasis, like vascular integrity and blood arrest. On average, the platelet count is between 150 and 450 giga per liter of blood. Okay, I know that we find this parameter on complete blood counts results. Um, so why are they so important to, uh, I would say, screen them again on uh, our field in hemostasis? As I said before, they are the principal actor of the so-called first phase of hemostasis or primary hemostasis. Upon inflammation or upon vascular injury, Platelets start adhering one to another and also to the endothelium. Then they aggregate and activate to form the platelet plug at the site of injury or inflammation. During this activation phase, platelets release the content of their granules, which usually triggers platelet aggregation amplification and other reactions in the inflammation system and immunity, but also triggers the coagulation enzymatic cascade. So it is clear now that platelets are key first effectors in the whole hemostasis process. Can you tell us more about platelet agregometry, please? Yes, it is a technique first developed in 1962 by Born and O'Brien, who independently published how it was possible to study the platelet function through light transmission in a steered platelet suspension. And still today, it remains a reference. Yes, Cécile, it remains the gold standard. To explain it further, light transmission agrigometry, or LTA, is a thermodimetric technique applied on a washed platelet preparation, or more frequently, platelet-rich plasma. You mix your sample with an activator, that we also call an agonist, which will bind to one of the platelet membrane receptors and induce its activation and aggregation if the receptor signaling pathway is operational. A light beam goes through the sample. Before any activation, light transmittance is poor because the resting platelets absorb the signal. But if platelets activate, they form aggregates which clear the plasma and the light transmittance increases. This change in the light transmittance is what we measure. Listening to you, David, I think we all have in mind now those very specific aggregation curves with the percentage of aggregation increasing over time. Yes, Cecile. And to scale the results and try to achieve a bit of standardization, you define your 0% aggregation on the PRP sample and your 100% aggregation in the corresponding platelet poor plasma. And David, you first stated that this is measured under steering condition. Why is so? For two main reasons. First, because platelets can sediment along the measurement. You have to keep in mind that the duration of a platelet aggregation measurement is usually around five minutes or slightly more. As this is not instantaneous, we have to steer the mixture to be sure that the change in transmittance is due to platelet aggregation and not to platelet sedimentation. And the second reason for steering is because to aggregate, platelets have to be in close contact. Very clear, David. And you also mentioned earlier that you can achieve the kind of standardization of curves through their 0 to 100% aggregation scaling. 
But I have in mind that the interpretation of those curves is something given to specialists only, right? Yes, platelet aggregation is part of the specialized test bench of the clinical laboratory. But more because of the handling of the technique, platelets require specific practice and you need dedicated staff around there to prepare timely the platelet-rich plasma from the blood sample. For many people, it remains a homemade technique, but the numerous guidelines available on the topic have made it possible to achieve good practices on the pre-analytical care to be taken on samples, etc. Talking about the interpretation, which was your question, Audrey, it is not that difficult once you have in mind the different types of aggregation curves you can have. Ah, yes, the famous uh, irreversible aggregation pattern, reversible one, biphasic one, etc., if I remember well. (laughs) Yes, exactly, Cécile. We can distinguish some typical aggregation curves, each of them inducing a different interpretation. And it also depends on the agonist used. And this makes the perfect transition, I think, to our question on the relevant use of platelet aggregation. When is it actually appropriate to measure it in the patient diagnosis workflow, David? You're right, I have to link it to agonist. I will not make the full list here, as the podcast format is probably not the most appropriate for this. But we can have in mind the use of ADP, adenosine diphosphate, to evaluate the function of P2Y12 receptors, which are target of clopidogrel, prasugrel, or ticagrel or treatments. Also, arachidonic acid to test the thromboxane A2 pathway, a target non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, such as aspirin. Collagen that will interact with GP1B2A and GP6 receptors. And ristocetin which is an antibiotic facilitating the fondylbrand factor binding to the GP1B platelet receptor. And uh, I suppose that these different receptors or, or, or pathways are tested in specific pathological settings, right? Yes, of course. Platelet function is usually assessed in different settings, usually more related to bleeding disorders investigation. We can list inherited platelet function disorders, such as Clansman's thrombasthenia, or bernard soulier syndrome, for example, or von Wilbrand disease investigation. And there are actually clear guidelines for this von Wilbrand disease diagnostic through it remains quite complex. Uh, Audrey, I think that we have our subject for our next podcast, actually. Yes, Cécile. Continuing on the areas where platelet agrigometry is useful, we have also anti-platelet treatment monitoring. Meaning there that you have to achieve patients' observance in their treatment and also if their platelets are actually responsive to it? This is it. There are different types of antiplatelet treatments, like monotherapy using drugs that inhibit COX-1, aspirin, P2Y12 receptors, such as clopidogrel, prasugrel, or ticagrel, or GP2B3A, abcizimab, or dual therapy like aspirin clopidogrel used in different settings, sometimes also to prevent stroke or myocardial infarction. So the cardiologist is better to know if his patient is actually correctly treated and also not too much because while preventing a clot, you do not want to induce bleeding which is a critical balance. So I'm looking at Audrey and I know it's time to end up this podcast. David, what would you like us to keep as a take-home message for our discussion today? Simply that uh, platelet agrigometry is not that complex once you have dived into it. But you have to exercise great care in handling platelet preparation and take care on pre-analytical steps. And no one should be afraid to practice LTA as there are now multiple guidelines from ISTH, from the British Society, the North America Consensus, etc. on how to perform platelet agrigometry. Finally, you may ask your providers to have clear indications on how to use their aggregometer, use their agonist and at which concentration and possibly get trained also on curves interpretation. Well, thank you, David, for these last words and for having demystified light transmission agrigrometry for us and our listeners. 
It's now time to close this episode. Thank you all for listening. As usual, all literature sources, and there are many these times, are listed in the podcast description. And please feel free to send us any question that you may have at our email address, askastago.com. We'll be happy to answer them in the next episode. See you next time. This podcast is brought to you by Stago. Diagnostics is in our blood.